Hello, and welcome back to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea, and I will be hosting today's podcast. Today, we will be talking to Dr. Matthias Schmidt, who is a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich, and focuses on the effects of stress on the body and on how stress can contribute to the development of psychiatric and metabolic disorders. As a little side note, this week is the Mental Health Awareness Week organized by the PhD Net. And so we thought that, that a podcast on stress would fit very well with the main theme of this week. Stress is something that we have all felt at one point in our lives. And nowadays, stress-related disorders are on the rise, such as psychiatric disorders with depression being the, uh, being the most common, as well as metabolic disorders, such as cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. And so it is a topic that I believe should be discussed, especially with an emphasis on the science behind why we experience stress. So in today's podcast, we will talk specifically about what stress is, whether there are good types of stress and bad types of stress, why different people are more stress vulnerable, what kind of genetic factors and genes make you more stress vulnerable. And here we will focus specifically on the research that is taking place within Matthias's lab. And finally, we will also uh, talk about what diseases stress can cause. I've been really excited about this podcast for a long time because I think it's a topic that everyone can relate to and it's such an important topic to discuss. I also think a discussion on the science of stress and more specifically what mechanisms cause stress and stress-related diseases is so important to have. So without me rambling too much, let's jump straight into the podcast. Hi, Matthias. Thank you so much for joining in the podcast today. I've been really excited about this episode for a very long time. Your research seems extremely interesting, um, so I'm really excited. So maybe you can start by introducing yourself and telling us what your name is and where you work and what exactly you do. All right. So I'm really happy to be here today. So my name is Matthias Schmidt. I work at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich. Uh, I'm a research group leader here. And uh, in my work, I'm a biologist from background, a neurobiologist. So in my work, I focus on the effects of stress on the body in both health conditions, but also following disease or how it contributes to disease. Nice. Um, so maybe then we can start by having you define what exactly stress is and what, have, what are kind of symptoms that people experience when they feel or have stress. Yeah, that, that's already quite a complex question. Let me try to dive into this. So everyone that is, uh, you know, basically everyone you meet will have uh, some experience with stress. And uh, uh, most people will say, yeah, I know stress. Uh, I know what stress is and what it feels like. But if you then ask people to define stress, it becomes pretty difficult, right? So people will start uh, giving you examples saying, oh, yeah, stress is when I have too much work, when, you know, I have uh, my boss is yelling at me or I have trouble in my relationship or there's time pressure and whatnot. So this is all examples or good examples of stress uh, situations, but it doesn't really capture the full entity of what stress is. And in, in biological terms, originally, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit of history uh, here. So originally, uh, if you, like 100 or 200 years ago, you would have asked and talked about stress in daily life. People would not have really understood what you mean because by that time, uh, the system was obviously still there, but uh, the concept of stress was not well defined yet and not in popular um, uh, and popular language arrived and um, it is uh, like one of the first researchers studying stress uh, was a, a guy called Hans Selye and he studied stress and also basically borrowed the term stress from physics where it is defined as pressure on a given area right the material can be on a lot of stress and applied it to biology so in biology nowadays, uh, stress is basically a situation where uh, an external or internal stimulus can be anything, can be heat, cold, can be hunger, 
uh, can be a loud noise, any stimulus that you sense internally or externally um, challenges your system and brings it out of homeostasis. So the balance of your system is called homeostasis. And any time the system and the balance is challenged, uh, then you experience stress. And what the, the body then does is initiates a stress response. So it will initiate a hormonal cascade and, and uh, release neurotransmitters. It's basically a whole body response, which uh, then leads to um, yeah, a stress response, which enables you to deal with the stressful situation, with the challenging situation better. So the way I understand you is that stress isn't just a feeling but we can actually, it happens on a biological level and we would be able to detect it on a biological level, right? Absolutely. So the easiest way to measure how uh, stressful a situation is or how much stress you're under is uh, the measurement of hormones. Uh, The most uh, common stress hormone um, is cortisol in humans. And uh, cortisol is released from your adrenal glands. These are glands which are sitting right on top of your um, kidneys. And uh, they release, uh, amongst other things, cortisol, which is one of your main stress hormones in the body. I should maybe back up here a little bit um, and explain a little bit uh, the concept that stress and also the stress response are actually quite adaptive and very important physiological mechanisms. And you wouldn't want to go without either the stress or the stress response system. Um, It is highly adaptive in a sense. And it's not always easy to differentiate you know what is uh, you know what when when stress hormones rise is this a good or a bad thing so for example your stress system has a circadian rhythm every stress system has that so um, in the morning when you rise when you go out of bed your stress hormone levels will rise they enable you to deal better with the challenges that await you when you start your day right so uh, you wake up and then you need energy to move around and you need to be alert all of these things uh, the stress hormones enable you to do Um, so you wouldn't say i'm stressed but still the level of stress um, or stress hormone levels in your body are increased, which is a good thing. Um, Problematic would be if you do not have this fluctuation and you have high stress levels throughout the day and the night because there, you know, you wouldn't, you would want them there, you wouldn't need them there. And uh, uh, then this might cause problems. And we can talk later about what kind of problems these are. Yeah, thank you. That was that was really nice. A uh, further extension to my question, and that actually brings me to the next question, which would be about the different types of stresses. So, are there different types of stresses? Because, like you said, um, stress can be hunger, stress can be cold exposure, heat exposure, and those kind of stresses are good for the body. I mean, we get told that uh, you know being exposed to cold or doing saunas, for example, is very healthy. So that kind of stress seems to be good, but then being under this chronic or long-term stress that I, I've heard is bad for you. So what is the difference there? And what is the difference of those stresses on a biological level as well? Yeah, uh, very good question. So th- th- again, it's not, not an easy answer, uh, but I will try um, to address this. So I would say the most important differentiation when it comes to stress, whether this is beneficial for you or not so beneficial is the way you can control and uh, predict it so as long as the stressor is predictable and controllable then the stress response is also in a sense predictable and controllable and uh, most of the research points in the direction that those kind of stressors and those kind of stress responses are actually beneficial for an organism to take the example of the sauna that you mentioned um the sauna i you know I basically control the access to the sauna. I know beforehand when I get in, there's going to be a heat challenge. Um, And the moment I think this is too much, I always have the option to go out again and cool down uh, and can terminate this external stressor. So this is a really good one. Uh, Hunger is the same thing. If I have food, at least I can, you know, terminate my hunger signal um, and consume food. 
So th these are all examples of, of good stressors. Uh, problems arise when a stressor is uncontrollable or unpredictable. And these uh, can be basically uh, in two categories. There's on the one hand traumatic stress, which is really, really strong, usually also very much unpredictable. So uh, you never know when the car accident was going to happen or sudden death of a relative or something like this so these are uh, traumatic experiences which you couldn't predict and you couldn't control i mean there is no way of control of a you know traumatic event that is happening to a person um, the other uh, thing that you mentioned already is the uh, chronicity of the stress exposure and here um, again I would say not necessarily is it the case that a chronic stress situation is always negative as long as it's controllable and somewhat predictable. But the moment you lose control of that chronicity where you say, okay, I cannot stop this. There is a certain pressure, a certain situation which I cannot control and I cannot remove myself from that stress situation, or at least you feel you can, you cannot. Um, then these sort of stress situations tend to increase the risk for all kinds of stress-related disorders. Yeah. But on a biological level, the um, whether you're exposed to, let's call it good stress or bad stress, the hormones that um, kind of get produced or increase, that's all the same, right? The system which responds to stress is always the same one. Um, but over time, there will be alterations in that system and the system will not work so well anymore. So, for example, um, the stress system uh, has a very efficient way of shutting down again after activation. There is a negative feedback uh, loop when once the hormones are released, they bind to receptors in the brain and basically tell the brain, okay, now stop and let's go back to our baseline. Um, if you are exposed to chronic stress over a very long period of time, uh, which you cannot control and where there is not enough fluctuation in your system, then uh, what often happens is that these receptors which sense that there is a lot of uh, stress hormones around will be desensitized, so they will not work as well anymore. And that then leads to the fact that even if you wanted to, you couldn't shut down this activity of your stress system anymore and it's chronically activated and loses is for example circadian rhythm may lose its responsivity in the positive sense but you can also not shut it down anymore so efficiently and this is uh, when problems generate because you have to imagine that the hormones actually so if i stick with corticosterone which is the rodent variant of cortisol. I may mix this here and there because I work with rodents, but so the stress hormone cortisol or corticosterone has a lot of functions in the periphery of your body as well as in the brain. Um, one of the major functions in the periphery is to uh, enable the use of energy. So it will promote um, the release of energy in your body so that you can actually deal with a stressful situation. This is excellent if you come across a lion in the African um, um, savanna and you want to run away real fast. Uh, at that moment, you want to have you want to be able to do this very quickly. So then, there's a lot of uh, glucose around that that makes you able to do this. If you're chronically producing this high level of energy and, and, and activating these catabolic events, then um, you will, at the end of the day, be exhausted because uh, you're basically driving your system always at 110%, 120%. And this is, on a long run, uh, not good for you. Yeah, so if you experience chronic stress, you probably wouldn't want to be um, exposing yourself to like good short-term stress, such as hunger or cold exposure, heat exposure, right? Well, I, I didn't, I'm, I'm not sure I quite uh, meant it like this. So you, you often you cannot control what kind of stressors you're exposed to. And I'm not aware of studies which said, okay, if you're chronically stressed, let's, in addition, try to stimulate the system with more acute and controllable stressors. It, it, the, the, the research goes more in the direction that if you're exposed to a chronic stress situation, you try to reduce this or try to at least increase the controllability of the stress situation. Um, you will not be able to avoid the acute challenges of life on, on, on an everyday manner, um, which, which are there and you know which you will you will not want and also not be able to control or avoid totally. Yeah. 
Um, and so how much stress is still good for you? And then what, and then how much stress is not good for you? Cause of course, like you said, evolutionarily stress was very important for us because, you know, it made us, uh, if we saw a lion, we have to run away. Um, so that was really important, but nowadays how much stress would be good for us? Yeah, this is also, I think, a question which is not easily answered because it will really depend on the individual person as well. We can also discuss this uh, if you want a little bit. So every person, of course, is different. And one of the like, there's two major differences when it comes to how people deal with stress. One is their genetic background. So genetically, people are variable. Um, and be because of this variability, some people will be genetically just better adapted to deal with more chronic or more challenging situations, uh, stressful situations than others. Um, the other aspect is uh, previous experiences. So whatever you experience, and this is starting already, actually, um, there's a lot of research where, uh, which already indicate this is not only your own life, but your parents' and grandparents' lives. So there's whatever they experienced uh, may be epigenetically transmitted to the parents and then to you. So there is a certain, which is not genetic, but on top of the genetic code, epigenetic inheritance, which may make you more vulnerable or resilient. And then there's all the experiences that you have while uh, during gestation of your mother, but then also uh, after birth, all the experiences basically accumulate. And not, depending on what you um, experience early in life, uh, this will also shape later on your stress resiliency. So there's always this gene by environment interaction. The environmental input you had throughout your life and your genetic background will shape individual stress resilience. So it is not so easy to say, okay, this much stress is good and this much stress is bad. I think what, what people would usually agree on is that a lot of uncontrollable and unpredictable stress is certainly not good for you um, because this would basically mean that you're always under a challenge situation which you cannot stop on your own because you just have to wait for the situation to pass if the situation is a very long one because you're 40 years in a job where you don't want to be and you know you, your environment is just very very stressful in that sense uh, and you cannot do anything about it or you feel you cannot do anything about it that's certainly not good there's still going to be people who deal with this reasonably well because they have maybe a genetic very high level of resiliency but it's still not something i would advise people to go into right um, on the other hand there's people who might not be so resilient in the first place and already smaller or comparably smaller um, episodes in life of stress uh, of chronic stress or traumatic stress will trigger or might trigger a stress-related disorder uh, of one way or another uh, and might not be uh, very good for the individual. So maybe let's go into a little bit more detail about um, the different stress vulnerability that people have, because that is something that fascinates me, how different people are, yeah, are more, more or less stress resilient. So maybe you can expand on that. We can talk a little bit about that. Sure. So let's start with the genetics. So there is, um, since a couple of you know, since a couple of years, um, it is possible to basically uh, decode the genetic profile of an individual person relatively quickly and cheaply. So uh, because this technology was developed, people started to do what is called genome-wide association studies. So the whole um, genome of a person is, is genotyped and then you have all these variabilities uh, in the genome from one person to the other and uh, the idea early on was that with this we will be very very quickly understanding uh, stress-related disorders psychiatric disorders and whatnot because we we can basically ask the question okay we have all of our let's say patients suffering from depression and we have a lot of people who don't and then uh, we can see what is the genetic difference between the group one and the group other um, this was partially successful but also turned out be, uh, to be very very difficult because what people found is that it's not one or two or three or five genes which contribute 
to the resiliency or the stress or the the risk to develop, for example, a stress-related psychiatric disorder. But there's hundreds, if not thousands, of variants which all have a certain contribution to this. So it is it is also not um, it is not easy to diagnose resilience if you want, because there is not a single measure or a group of measures which uh, which can be used to say, okay, this is a resilient person. You are very resilient. Don't worry about anything. And another person where you would say like, oh, look, we have to be careful. There are certain examples. Uh, we can talk later a bit about our own work of genes, which which are quite prominent and, and where um, genes or systems were uh, very often related to stress resiliency or vulnerability but at the end of the day we always need uh, a mixture of measures and a mixture of um, of, of markers to um, to detect resiliency and this is actually currently um, a hot research field where we and others are working on very hard and um, to basically uh, define a biomarker signature which may be um, not only genetic markers but also physiological markers which may be uh, related to brain imaging and whatnot and combine all this to say okay i have a biosignature and if this signature is like this then uh, i can say this is a re resilient individual or a vulnerable individual but it's going to be multiple markers um, and not only one or two yeah, and so um, I've cheated a bit because I've looked at your website. So um, I've looked in, in a bit into your research. Obviously, I didn't know anything. But um, it seems like you guys are working on this FKBP51 gene. Uh, and you identified that as being one of these uh, kind of biomarkers that could show that if you have a higher amounts of it, uh, you, might, you may be more stress resilient. So um, do you want to go into detail about that and explain that a bit? I'd love to, yeah, because this is, uh, even though it has a very bulky name, I got used to it, and FKBP51 is really uh, a really hot candidate for also later on potential intervention. So it was first, you know, discovered in, in relation to stress-related disorders, I would say about 16, 17 years ago, when there was one of these genome-wide association studies performed and polymorphisms, so alterations in the DNA sequence in this gene were associated with uh, depression at that case. And later on, this finding was confirmed and extended to other stress-related disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, where the same polymorphisms in the gene of FKBP51 are related to the incidence of the disorder. And in many cases in a gene by environment interaction so if then people were asked for example how much traumatic experiences they had uh, early in life it was especially the ones which had a lot of traumatic and stressful experiences um, which were the ones who were at the higher risk to develop the disorders so um this is when basically a little while later that we started looking also into this, what was also known about uh, or at least suggested at the time about the function of this protein, that it interacts with one of the main receptors of the stress system, the glucocorticoid receptor, and modulates the sensitivity. And I mentioned earlier that the sensitivity of this feedback and the sensitivity of this receptor is super important for regulating the stress response. So here were two things coming together the genetic findings in humans and the biological findings that people identified saying, okay, this is a very central player in regulating how you respond biologically to stress. So let's uh, start looking at this. And in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we have done this and we have shown that the uh, FKBP5, FKBP51 protein is really central in orchestrating the stress response. It's, it's really essential in also mediating your level of resiliency. And by now, we also have um, pharmacological tools, which are very specific drugs um, or drugs in development, which, um, which target only this protein and where we can basically intervene also um in like at the end of the day in humans because you have to imagine that most of this work uh, from the uh, functional and biological sense you have to do in an animal model first 
Uh, obviously, we would like to do it uh, in a cellculture dish or something like this, but when we are asking questions about depression, anxiety, stress hormone responses in the body, obviously, there's nothing we can do in a cellular system. We have to go to a full uh, physiological system. Um, so this is uh, the only uh, model that we have available to work with is the animal. We do most of our work in mice. And... Um, and then uh, in the mice, we can, of course, do very detailed things like, you know, deactivate a certain group of neurons or activate a certain group of cells in the periphery and see what that does. But uh, when we want to translate this knowledge to uh, eventual application in humans, uh, this is becoming much more difficult. You will not want to have, uh, you know, brain surgery every time you want to treat rest stress resilience, right? So uh, ideally, we'll have a pharmacological tool in hand. And this is why this development was so essential that we now have uh, two compounds which can very specifically target this protein and help to um, enhance stress resilience. So in terms of like treating stress, um, you mentioned that, you know, st stress is still, there's so many different factors that can cause stress resilience. So it's, you guys have identified this one gene and there, you said there's potential drugs that can interact with it or with the protein. But do you think that that could actually be used then as an, a treatment against stress? Or is it just still way too hard to, uh, to treat stress because it depends on so many different factors. Yeah, maybe coming back to the beginning of our chat here, stress per se is actually a quite a good thing. So I wouldn't want to treat stress or the stress response as a starting point because you will need your stress response to uh, appropriately re react. And this is also, I think, quite important. Uh, it would not, you would not easily or necessarily go uh, and say i, I want to have a general preventive strategy for everyone um, because some people will have a very um, adapted stress response system and there you do not want do not want to interfere with this you do want to interfere with the stress response system when it's overactive when it's out of control when it's dysregulated which is usually the case in in stress related disorders so in these cases if you already developed a stress-related disorder, or if your biomarker signature indicates that you are at risk to developing a stress-related disorder, so you may not have developed a depression yet, but you are at a high risk because your stress system is already out of control, and there's a really high likelihood that later on this might uh, lead to this, then uh, yes, uh, we are developing um, these tools further to actually be able to intervene and treat this the, overactive stress system and consequently also stress-related disorders, yes. And what about genetic engineering? So could you maybe use genetically, uh, genetic engineering to uh, genetically engineer genes to make you more stress resilient? Is that something that is you consider or is talked about in your field? In theory, yes, that's possible. Um, the ethical implications and the practical implications uh, make the hurdle much, much higher. So for specific diseases where... Uh, you know, you have a, a single defined target and uh, and there is a very clear uh, phenotype and no other uh, good interventions. And I, I think the genetic engineering path is, is developed and, and people are looking at the options of this for stress resilience and stress related disorders are so common. So if you just talk about depression has a lifetime uh, prevalence of let's say 15% or so it's higher in women than in men. That basically means uh, every you know fifth or sixth person will experience uh, depression at some time in their life, right? You do not want to uh, genetically engineer all these people, right? So this is Genetic engineering, I believe, is really something which you do in a very select patient population where you have a very clear target um, for th something like stress-related disorders in general, which we will want to treat a lot of people, millions of people, uh, and want to also give the availability of treatment. Um, other options need to be developed. One is pharmacological interventions, but there's also other ways to increase your stress resilience, which we're researching on, which are even less invasive, if you want, as a pharmacological intervention. Um, you actually mentioned something really interesting that there's a difference between men and women and how and um, 
whether they experience depression or not. So I think you said that women experience more depression than men yeah. or was it vice versa? No, no. Yeah. Um, and so on a biological level as well is why do, do women and male experience different amounts of stress? And if so, why? Well, on the one hand, um, your question asks, is there a different level of stress generally between men and women? This is probably true, um, but I, I, I cannot really say this. Uh, it's probably true depending on the source of stressors. I'm quite sure that women have different kinds of stressors which stress them more than men or vice versa. But on a biological level, it is absolutely clear that the stress response and the stress system uh, of uh, women and men is quite different. The, the building parts and the building blocks are the same. So the same genes involved, the same pathways involved. But the way the system is fine-tuned and is working and responding to a stress situation uh, is very, very different. Um, and there is a lot of data now actually uh, emerging also to look at these sex differences, which is very important because unfortunately, in the preclinical research with animal models for a long time, um, there was a bigger tendency to work with male animals only and not include females. And this has, you know, some historical and some people argued practical reasons. So to start with one sex and because there is no or less hormonal fluctuations in the, in the males, it was argued, yeah, we start with males and then the females uh, will probably work the same or we'll look at later. This was obviously a mistake and this is now being addressed quite, uh, had, you know, quite straightforward. And people are now um, very much encouraged to include both uh, sexes in their experimental studies. And, and they do find that there is very robust and uh, strong differences in the way um, animals, but also humans, experience stress and respond to a stressor. And also the consequences of the stress exposure are can be quite different. And this was known for a long time. Uh, depression is just one of the examples where there's a clear sex difference in uh, in the number of patients that that suffer from a from a disorder, uh, but there's many others where where we know that there is a difference in in, in sex and and the prevalence of the disorder, also and other things like symptoms or uh, how long the symptoms last and things like this. So this um, might at least in part be due to also the differences in the physiological differences in how the stress response works, and uh, this is now being being studied intensively. And so could you imagine there to also then potentially be different treatments against stress or stress-related diseases for men and women since we do respond differently? Absolutely. And not only men and women, but actually what we want to achieve at the end of the day is a personalized treatment where uh, many things are taken into account, not only your sex, but also your age, uh, your background, maybe whether you're a smoker or not, uh, what other experiences they had. So a lot of things uh, would be assessed. And it's um, at the moment, treatment is often kind of one size fits all. So you go with a stress-related disorder to your physician, to your doctor, and you will get the same treatment as the first line of treatment as most of the other patients, even though uh, you may be very different in terms of the age group or your previous experiences or whether you're man or woman. So this, I think, will change that, that we will have more specific treatments to more specific uh, phenotypes, which includes also the, the sex of an individual. That's really interesting. I'm really excited also to, to see where that develops. Uh, that's super exciting. And so we've already talked, you had already talked a bit about the kind of disorders or diseases that stress can cause. So maybe let's talk a bit about that. So what kind of diseases can stress cause? Yes, sure. So it's actually, you would, you would be hard pressed to name a disorder or a disease which is absolutely not influenced by stress but there's uh, many disorders which which are 
more prone to be stress-related than others. Um, amongst the field of psychiatric disorders, uh, it is very clear that, for example, depression, major depression, or a lot of the anxiety disorders are very closely related to stress experiences. Stress is a trigger. Some of them, uh, it is absolutely a, a part of the definition, if you want. So post-traumatic stress disorder, there's always a traumatic event uh, to define and diagnose the disorder. Um, not every person who is suffering from a depression has uh, experienced uh, severe stress or uncontrollable stress, but uh, there is very clear data across the different studies that uh, traumatic or long-term stress exposures increase on average about twofold uh, your likelihood to uh, develop depression later on in life. And this is true per stressful life event. So uh, stress will really increase the likelihood for you uh, to develop a disease like depression. But it's not only the psychiatric disorders, also uh, metabolic disorders, for example, uh, diabetes, um, obesity uh, are very much linked to stress experiences. Uh, cardiovascular disorders are very much linked to uh, stress experiences. Some of these are, are, are pretty, if you want, at least for a layperson, straightforward and clear because you know that stress affects these systems. So the stress hormones do affect uh, your metabolism. So if you constantly drive your metabolism overdrive, to then there's very li high likelihood to develop a misalignment and later on a disorder. The same is true for your heart, for example. Um, of course, if you're, you know, challenging your cardiovascular system uh, all the time more than you should be without kind of the times where you can relax, then you will also uh, generate these problems. One of the first uh, stress um induced um disorders if you want that were noted were stomach ulcers so uh, when people did uh, stress research also on animals uh, i mentioned hans Selye. he found uh, that stress exposure of kind of any kind would lead to an increase on in the incidence of stomach ulcers which again makes a little sense because in a stressful situation there's certain systems of the body which are overactivated to make them more um, you know adapted to the challenging situation and other things which are not so needed at this time like for example your intestine and uh, your um your, your digestion system will be reduced in activity because at that moment you don't need this and you may want to save energy. But if you do this all the time and chronically, then you can also imagine that this causes problems and, and diseases. So there's, there's actually a lot of physiological um, disorders also related to the immune system, which is very much affected by stress, um, and also psychiatric disorders, which are related to brain function, which can arise from stress, from chronic stress. That's a really fascinating topic because we basically are living in an obesity pandemic nowadays with obesity cases just rising a lot. And so if we could be able to treat obesity or metabolic diseases such as diabetes by treating stress instead, that, that would be really cool. That's an area of research I'm really happy that you guys are looking into. Um, and yeah, maybe yeah, I can sure. Sorry. add to this because this is really also a topic which is close to my heart. So that the protein I mentioned, FKBP51, when we started studying this initially in relation to stress and psychiatric disorders, we also noted that the animals which were lacking this uh, stress-induced protein were also leaner. So they didn't have as much weight. As, as their wild type litter mates. So we started looking into this and found indeed that this, if you want, if you, if you, this anti-stress treatment, either genetically or pharmacologically, when we inhibit this stress-induced protein, it's not only increasing your stress resilience in terms of behavior and hormonal regulation, but it's also making you more resistant to, for example, a high-fat diet. So obviously, obesity is not only 
genetic or this is not only uh, stress. There's a lot of things one can do in terms of, you know, food intake is kind of the most important risk factor uh, for obesity. So if you eat a lot of uh, McDonald's and junk food, then uh, there's a higher likelihood of you becoming obese. However, um, if you are more resilient in terms of the stress interaction, and FKBP51 is a very nice example here, um, then you may also be more resilient in the negative effects of this uh, of this stressor on your metabolism. So this is actually something we're now developing further because it's a little easier to to, to develop drugs which are targeting only the periphery. So if we target FKBP51 only in the periphery, we have good data indicating that we can battle uh, stress-related uh, disorders like diabetes and obesity. And, and this is something which we believe we can start with um, uh, clinical trials in at least a few years. That's part one, everyone. See you all tomorrow for part two of this podcast on the science behind stress. In part two, we will also dive into what tools and treatments can be used to prevent stress, how we can mitigate our own stress and help others mitigate their own stress. And last but not least, we talk about the impact that COVID has had on our stress levels. Part two will be coming out tomorrow, so definitely stay tuned for that. See you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck's PhD Nets Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.